Hello and welcome to this segment of Arts Talk. I'm Sherry Burr, your host, and I'm delighted to have as my guest for this episode a creative person extraordinaire, Hakeem Bellamy. Welcome, Hakeem. <laughs> okay. So Hakeem is a poet, an actor, a musician, um, a television show host. It seems like you've explored just the full range of creativity, except for maybe painting. Do you paint as well? No, I don't paint. You don't okay. want to see that. All right. That's, that's <laughs> it's, it's very tragic. Okay, so <laughs> you have the distinction of having been named as Albuquerque's first poet laureate. So can you tell us how that came about? Man, yeah, it was uh, all the stars aligned. Um, mm -hmm. it, what's most interesting about the process is that uh, two years before we actually had our first search for mm -hmm. Poet Laureate One, um, uh -huh. there was a poet by the name of Stuart Warren mm -hmm. who moved down here from uh, okay. Colorado, north of us, okay. and kind of brought the idea to Albuquerque oh. that, that we should do something that you know was happening in other places. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, I was I know Stuart from poetry readings, mm -hmm. and I was kind of helping think out this thing with okay. him and uh, was invited actually to be on the first selection committee oh, as well. You were uh, on the selection no, committee? No, I was invited to be, but uh, okay. I ended up not serving on the selection okay. committee okay. Um, because I didn't think that I should be part of the process because I wasn't from Albuquerque or New Mexico. And I was, I was pretty dug in about that. Mm -hmm. um, and as the process evolved and we created a selection committee and a search committee and the advisory council, mm -hmm. um, I was Co convinced and in some ways coerced uh -huh. <laughs> by some of the other committee members uh -huh. and they were like you, you should apply for this I okay. mean the, the, the idea that you have to have lived here five years mm -hmm. and you need to be over 18 and have a body of work to point at those are really all the qualifications oh. and so uh, I was sick the Christmas break before the submissions were due mm -hmm. and I caved in and submitted and I was fortunate enough to be selected by the wow. city of Albuquerque so okay and one of your most well-known poems, I think it's called We Are the City? Yeah. Okay, so let's have you perform it for us. Sure, no problem. We be a bucket of Rio, two handfuls of Mesa, an open box full of God between the Sandias and the volcanoes, our name is mud. We be close enough to heaven and clear enough of sky for the creator to mouth to mouth us alive. We make dirty, the new immaculate make car washes obsolete. We be urban farmhands for rural app developers, be the best brewed beans and microbrew in a six mesa radius in a hundred manana radius. We be coffee shop crushes and conversations. We be the creme de la creatives. We powder with pollen and monsoon foundation for makeup on the rare occasion that we make up only when the winter white tablecloths the mesa. We be aquifers of brown gold. We be the same colored souls. We be an open heart horizon, transplants, land grants, and colonial survivors. We be of the earth and out of this world. At the same time, we inherit this pride, this keep it real estate of intellectual property. We be Q-U-E-R-Q-U-E-A. We be sunsets so beautiful they paint themselves on the edge of the earth. We be where dreams come to live and retire. We be artists making careers out of thin air. We be made up words like Sunport, because stars got to land somewhere, because the center of the universe has got to be somewhere, because even the sun has a vacation home in New Mexico. We be made upwards, not downwards, like mountaintops. We be adobe inside and out. We might look like armored vegetarians, but on the inside, we be the coolest gatas you'll ever meet. We be entrepreneurs and doers. Somewhere between bright idea and done and done. We be Chile by blood and balloons for lungs. We be no I in team, but two in familia. We be full moons in photosynthesis, not a cloud to be found. We be radiant, worshiping the sky with hand signs that 505, letting our unidentified flying cousins know that we out here fighting for our light. We be local. We be loco. We be lobos singing to the night. We are your favorite city's favorite city the heart of the Southwest, leaning just a little to the left in New Mexico's chest. Wow. 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 
<laughs> that was absolutely extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. For well, my city. Yes. <laughs> wow. Um, so tell us about your creative process. Do you get an idea and then where do you go with it? Yeah, I just, I kind of gestate with it. I cook it. Um, mm -hmm. When I'm asked to prepare a poem, uh, particularly that poem for the We Are The City initiative, mm -hmm. I was asked by Max Baptiste mm -hmm. maybe, oh gosh, two and a half years ago when mm -hmm. he was first like, hey, I want to do this thing. Would you be involved? Would you help us write a manifesto? So it, for me, it always starts with homework. Mm -hmm. I looked at some other projects like uh, Colorado mm -hmm. um, um, has a poem that was actually written by a friend of mine, uh, Ken mm -hmm. Arkine, who's a poet. Mm -hmm. And I already, kn I already knew that they were using his poem uh -huh. to, to Denver. Uh -huh. uh, uh, they were using it at the Denver Nugget Games, and so uh -huh. it was easy to find. They, were, okay. they did a big video, it was put on the Jumbotron. Um, and then I looked at uh, Colorado Spring had done a, a similar project in trying mm -hmm. to revitalize their downtown, mm -hmm. and they had a manifesto that was not necessarily as poetic, but it was like, this is who we are, and this is what we believe. Mm -hmm. And so I study first, and I study and look at all the ideas to see what's out there, right. and then try to find a new right. take on it or a new right. turn on it. And uh, yeah, I, there's no predictability. And when that happens, I just kind of sit with the work. And then one day I'm like on a treadmill at the gym and I'm like, oh, and I get off and I find my phone and I'm like, this is the idea. This is the seed of the idea. Wow. And then, uh, and then once that happens, it's just a matter of finding time to sit down and write the thing. Wow. And it was fascinating how you captured so many elements of Albuquerque from green chili to balloons, you know, the kinds of things that we associate with the town. It was just, it was wonderful. So thank, thank you, you so much for, for sharing that. You are also a musician. So tell us how you got into music. I understand you grew up playing the piano. I grew up playing the piano. Uh, my parents were like those kind of good black parents that were like, boy, you're going to get some culture. You're going to get some <laughs> art. And so I had to do piano lessons. I had is the key word. I had to sing in the church choir. I yeah. had to act in every single Easter play and be in drama club at school. And, and I was an athlete. And so the, the, the carrot was always like, if you want to play soccer, you need to do this. If you want to play oh. basketball, you need to do this. And, um, and at the time, I thought it was torture. <laughs> and, uh, and, then I, and then, you know, this many years later, it is my career and it's, it's right. who I am. And so... You know, I, I, that was like the beginning of me being able to express myself artistically and doing uh -huh. it in spaces that I felt safe and encouraged. Right. Um, and that builds confidence in a right. young person. So when, you know, uh, years down the road, when I'm, you know, trying to uh, impress, you know, uh, a young lady, which is actually how I got into poetry. And, and Oh, just know, writing like a just, poem for was, a date? I was trying to, my son's mother, actually. Uh -huh. and, and, and her being like, you know, this is good. And not just because, you know, uh -huh. you're cute and I want to date you, but it's actually good. You should read it somewhere besides in my apartment. And I was like, yeah, maybe I should. And as that continued to evolve and I moved to Albuquerque, I went to my first slam and, uh -huh. and it was just like, things kind of took off from there. I, okay. we, we won a national poetry slam championship and then I'm, in classrooms, teaching poetry, having only ever taken one creative writing class. And so, so like that was like th that trajectory, but the music uh -huh. was, was the beginning of like me finding, finding a safe space to make mistakes, mm -hmm. finding a safe space to learn in public mm -hmm. and get good at something because you have to be bad at something for a long time before you get good at something. And so mm -hmm. music was that start for me. And, and my poetry happens to be really rhythmic. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be much more rhythmic than even the poem I read for you. It, mm -hmm. it, people would immediately ask me after I read poems, Don't, do you rap? And I was like, yeah, I grew up rapping, but I don't know if I, I rap. And they were mm -hmm. like, well, you should. And I was like, I would if I could, but I don't make music. And they were like, I got a studio. And I was like, studios cost money. And they're like, no, come on. And then I'm doing oh, music. Wow. <laughs> so, That's <laughs> great. Because rap does have that poetry element to it. Yeah. The it spoken does. word. It does. Yes. Good rap. Yes, yeah, good rap. <laughs> <laughs> good rap, guys. Um, and also, you're an actor. So tell us about some of the acting projects you've been involved in. Same thing, you know, when I was out doing my poems and then kind of growing my, my career here in Albuquerque, people would see me perform and say, what you do is very theatrical. And I'm like, mm -hmm. of course, because I'm a drama queen. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, but they were like, you know, have you ever tried your hand at acting? And I was like, you know, like everyone else in drama club in high school, sure, but I never thought that that would be me one day. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the play I'm currently in actually is called Caesar's Blood, mm -hmm. and it is based on the life of 
John Wilkes Booth and his three brothers, oh. um, who were all very famous actors, and right. their father was a very famous actor, right. but you never hear about that because right. of what he did five months right. after our play. Right. So, so th what's interesting about the current play is that I am reunited with the director who kind of gave me my first acting role mm -hmm. in 2008 in, in Romeo and Juliet at the mm -hmm. Vortex, uh, mm -hmm. Ryan Jason Cook. And so he took a chance on me mm -hmm. and, and in a big cast and a kind of iconic play that most uh -huh. people know. And right. so you can't like fudge the lines in Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. And it's Shakespeare. Right. I don't speak Shakespeare. So I right. learned how to speak Shakespeare. And it was a at that time, it was the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. Uh, Bar was, none. You was know, it was, it was the, the hardest rhythm. thing. Yeah, yes. like trying to speak convincingly, right. speak Shakespeare. Like I actually knew what I was saying and not just repeating. Right words and uh what character did you play because we think of it as being set in in verona uh with a feud among italians so i was juliet no <laughs> i was uh i was the friar and and ryan's take on the play okay. was to do something like post-apocalyptic okay. like he definitely um if you saw baz lerman's okay. romeo and juliet we contemporized it um, and then we kind of put it in the future after oh. like some sort of nuclear fallout or you know whatever we oh, poison wow. all the water Okay. Nothing like what's actually happening, but yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> That's interesting. And what role are you playing in the current play? In uh, Caesar's Blood, I am the valet okay. um, of, of Mr. Edwin Booth, who is the older of the three Booth okay. brothers right. in the play. And it's all, it's factually based. It's rooted in an actual performance that they did to raise money for a statue of William Shakespeare that stands in Central Park to this day. Wow. And uh, they did that. The only time the brothers ever performed together. Uh -huh. um, and they were going to do a second performance. Uh -huh. But in the time between those two performances, John Wilkes Booth did what he did. Wow. Lost it. So he was definitely, it sounds like, the bad sheep of that family. Yeah, mm. interesting feller. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, my goodness. Um, as you know, we're filming before an audience of law students, so I wanted to see if there are questions for Hakeem Bellamy. So um, I'm a native Albuquerquean, and you know, you're a transplant to Albuquerque. I sometimes feel like um, people who come here experience the city differently than those of us who grew up here. Mm -hmm. So what's something about Albuquerque that you wish the natives of Albuquerque would appreciate uh, maybe more than we do? Oh, that's a good question. That's a great question. Uh, so I work with young people a lot. I do a lot of poetry writing workshops with high schoolers and, and, and college student, college age students. And they, they can't wait to get out of here. And I feel like I felt the same way growing up in South Jersey, right outside of Philadelphia where I grew up. It was like, I can't wait to get away from my parents. I can't wait to do something different. And, and I'm always like, but it's so awesome here. Why would you ever want to leave, right? You know? and, and I understand that that's a natural kind of circle of life kind of thing. But I also am like, you'll be back. You will, because I, I'm not trying to sound like some, like, you know, I'm an East Coaster and I've seen the world. I haven't. But I do know that I've been a lot of places and there's no place quite like this. And I think that when people leave and see other places and realize there's no place quite like this, <laughs> that they, you know, they either want to come back or they don't. And, you know, I know for my family back on the East Coast, um, after we get the geography right and I explain to them that we are on this side of the border and we do use dollars <laughs> and, and, and after we get that all figured out right you know um, I tell them you know you either love it or you hate it mm -hmm. which is great because if you hate it bye bye Felicia and if you love it you know if you love it you 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 stay and then that's the whole enchantment entrapment thing and it's beautiful but yeah you don't get to be lukewarm yeah, on yes. Albuquerque like you or, or New Mexico in general you either love it or you know you can write. Yes. You should write. Okay. <laughs> and speaking of writing, yeah. I went to Southwest Writers Meeting and I recruited some writers to come because this is National Poetry Month. Um, and uh, Mary was one of the um, volunteers. volunteers who I recruited. I, I stood up and said that I'm having um, you as a guest. And she's a poet. She came up to me afterwards. Uh, and said so she's a poet and she introduced herself before the show and I think she has a question for you now. Okay, I was just very interested where we were uprooted from because I too am from the East Coast and what you said about this place, it is unique. And people say, are you ever going to come back? I don't think so. I mean, this weather we're having, this, this environment we're having, it's not called the land of enchantment for nothing. And some of my poems have included such uh, descriptions of our landscape and I'm just so happy there's somebody like you that can even make it more well known to people that don't really know that we are not part of Mexico 
Okay. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Joaquin. Okay. So you obviously love Albuquerque, and I know that you just wrote an elevator pitch for the city. Can you tell us about that process and how you got picked and where that inspiration evidently came from? You, you ooze it. You ooze the inspiration. But how did, how did you compose that in such a succinct package? All the things I feel for Albuquerque in 250 words or less is difficult. Um, anybody who's ever written an elevator speech knows that it's hard to, to say a lot with a little, but that is essentially what poetry is supposed to do. It's supposed to be a, a novel on a page. It's supposed to be impactful language that punches you on levels, mm -hmm. right? And so I felt like, yeah, I could do this. And then I saw, and then I was selected. I was asked, I was invited to, to submit a pitch by the Urban Land Institute. And then I looked at the other 12 pe or other 11 people that were invited, and they were all like business people, chamber of commerce, like I'm going through all their bios, and I was like, okay, I'm the odd guy out here because I'm a poet. And then we sent in all of our headshots, and like mine is like, you know, totally urban, like graffiti in the background. And I was like, one of these things is not like the other. So, um, so then I was like, I'm just going to write a poem. Like I'm going to do what I know how to do. Uh, I hope that's why they invited me. And either people will love it or, or hate it again, right? You know, and I was like, it'll be different. At least they'll be like, this one's not like these 11. And so uh, I took a chance and a good gamble, I guess, because it worked. And I think it resonated with people in a different way because uh, I didn't, you know, I think when you think elevator pitch, it's like, what's good for business? What's good for business in Albuquerque? What's good for business in Albuquerque is the same thing as what's good for people in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. Good weather, good food, uh, connection to our culture. And I was like, how do I say all that in a way that some guy in a three-piece suit would actually like listen to me in an elevator <laughs> for two minutes telling him that and so that was that's what I kind of that was my approach whether I executed it well or not I don't know but I won the the contest but I do know that I write about Albuquerque a lot so I felt like I had almost had an unfair advantage because I had already written a series of poems about my city uh, love poems to my city and hopefully they get better with time and that's just the most recent one I've written. Wow. By the way, the mayor adores you. We had him here as a guest last year, and he was singing your praises. Okay, so we've got another question. Hi, Hakeem. My name's Joaquin. Yes. And um, just I want to thank you for being on the show um, and for sharing your poetry. It's very, very beautiful and has a huge impact. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about um, spoken word as, as, a, as a medium and kind of uh, what that does to the students you work with, particularly students from you know, minority communities. Absolutely. Thank you for that question, Joaquin. Uh, so we practice, what I like to think we practice, is we practice you know, um, developing one's identity and, and, and a practice of empowerment. And not because necessarily that we're doing this thing that most people fear, right? Public speaking is always on the list of like death, spiders, and public speaking, the things people are most afraid of. Um, and, and so I think that they're, in empowering them to overcome a fear, that is the practice of performance poetry and spoken word poetry. Whether they go on to write a plethora of poems for the rest of their life, or they never write again, they still have the experience of having um, voluntarily signed up for a challenge or an obstacle and overcome it, right? Um, and kind of run towards the, the growth, I hope, like, you know, instead of running away from it. And so when I work with young students um, of all ethnicities and races, but especially muted voices, which are minority voices, which are queer voices, which are women's voices, and saying this thing that's normally associated with some sort of weird alpha masculinity um, is something that men are terrified to do too. And that's why when I go into classrooms and I'm like, who wants to do it? All the tough guys are like, no, man, I'm cool. I don't need to do it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you're scared. And they're like, no, I ain't scared. I was like, well, they come up here. Like, you know, like, and, and so like using that as a, as a challenge to them, but also to kind of bring more different and diverse voices to the fold because what you have in three minutes at a poetry slam is you have a captive audience. Yes. Uh, my challenge to the students is what are you going to do with that? What do you want them to know when they leave about you, about the world around you, about how you see the world? And, uh, and this, like anything else, you can get better at with practice. It's not magic. I mean, some people are more, you know, verbose and loquacious and like to stand in front of audiences, but you can learn to, to tell a good story, you know, so. Wow. That's amazing. You know, it's interesting how people may write one poem or they may make a career out of it. My mother is a published uh, poet. 
Um, and do you find that people often come up to you the way Mary did and share poems that they've written? Does that's that happen to you a lot? That's part of being a poet. I okay. think that there's a, there's a misconception, especially uh -huh. with performance poetry, that, um, that the cool thing about it is being able to like, have people be quiet and listen to you. And though that's what we sell in relation to Joaquin's question, we sell that to young people because they never mm -hmm. get listened to in our society. Mm -hmm. So becoming a slam poet is an opportunity for them to actually have adults shut up for a second and hear mm -hmm. them. Um, but the best part is actually the inverse, is that every time I stand on stage and read a poem for three minutes or five minutes and I get off stage, two or three people come up to me and say, hey, I'm a poet. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I share a poem with you? Mm -hmm. So I often say for every poem I give, I get two back. Right. And, and, and that listening piece is how mm -hmm. we write. Like listening, looking, mm -hmm. feeling, smelling, loving, all of those right. things is how we write poems. And so, yeah, you, it can't be one directional communication. Right. And you know what's great is you just declare yourself a poet, right? You write a poem and that yeah. makes you a poet. So it's not like you have to get additional certification or anything like you that. You don't, and that's what's really cool about this kind of contemporary movement of uh -huh. performance poetry, or uh -huh. some people call it slam, but there's a bigger box beyond slam mm -hmm. of performance poetry that's not uh, degree-based. Mm -hmm. It's not based on where you want to your, get your MFA from or your writing program. Mm -hmm. um, and that, again, allows more voices to the fold. Right. And, and um, that upsets some people who spent a lot of money on their degree in uh -huh. English uh, and, and schools oh. who want to hold on to that right. and not allow for the democratization of that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the Internet's making everything free. Right. So why shouldn't poetry and art be free as well? So if someone comes up to you and they want to make a living as a poet, what kind of advice would you give them? I say don't. <laughs> <laughs> I say define living. Uh, so, but, uh, but no, I, I say that, you know, there's a, there's a book that I give, that was given to me, actually, mm -hmm. that I give, like, my mentees and young people that I get to work with called Major in Success, and not really necessarily plugging Patrick Combs' book, but the, thing, the main premise of his book was that if you do something out of love, you'll do it well. And if you do it well, people will pay you for it. Not everybody has to like it. Like, not everybody likes a certain kind of music but musicians do well, you know, and so you just have to know that if you really are dedicated to it and you really want to do it, there's a market for what you do. Okay. Are you willing to be, stay in the game long mm -hmm. enough and, and, and be disciplined at your craft long enough to find that audience? Right. That's up to you, but you can be. Okay, so most poets, 99% mm -hmm. of them then have a day job, another job? Yeah, I, you know, I think that that is generally true. Okay. Um, even when I was being a full-time artist for two years before I, I took a job at the city, uh -huh. um, you said the mayor is a fan of mine, and, and him and I, we've known each other because of my time as Poet Laureate, right? And oh, so okay. I got to okay. be I I with him in a, in a room, and he's like a real person. He's not right. just like a guy that, you know, right. uh, passes policies that you do and don't like. He's a real person, and he likes the arts, and so he, he always said he would kind of find a position for me after I was done, and I didn't believe him, because I generally don't believe politicians. <laughs> I was like, that sounds nice, whatever. I'll believe uh -huh. you when you call, and then one day I was sitting in my car, and they were like, yeah, the mayor wants you to come and talk about the position that he has for you. So, um, wow. so that's how I ended up there. But before that, I was doing my art full time, and I think there's this conception or misconception that I was sitting in my attic with a pipe and a smoking jacket writing poems all day, and that's not actually how it went down. Like, uh -huh. I had to teach you know, teach poetry right. and do a lot of workshops right. and then do some commission right. poems over here. And all of that is amazing and it's poet adjacent, right. but it's not me sitting at home dreaming up right. the next great American poem. And right. so, yeah, you do have to do something else, yes. but that's good right. because if you don't do something else, then what are you writing about, right? right? What do you have to write about? So. Right, you have to live your life in search of material to a certain extent. Yeah. And it sounds like the life of a poet is kind of like the life of a musician where you have many streams of income from That's teaching, it. from performance, from writing, and so forth. From people taking pity on you, <laughs> okay. buying you meals. We call that the food economy. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> patrons is right. what they call patrons it. Patrons of the, the arts, it's yes, nice. Yes, patrons they of poetry. They used to do that. Yeah, yes, you, yes. You find like a baroness yeah. or a baron that exactly. would just Who fund supports your whole you. The Medici's, yes, they mm -hmm. took on a lot of artists. Only so, I were alive in the 1400s. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us your beautiful poetry and your life as a poet. I mean, you're extraordinary, and we just appreciate that you're you willing too, Dr. to. Burr. Oh, thank, thank you. <laughs> you are willing to be on the show. Thank Thanks you, for Hakeem. Having me. Thank you, guys.
And thank you, the audience, for joining us for this segment of Arts Talk with Hakeem Bellamy. Okay, are we done? No, no. All right, thank you. Thank you class. Is this crop water or can I actually? No, that's actually water. Okay, good. Yes, <laughs>